The Superior Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was created in 1859. The uh, Superior Court initially uh, was called the Court of Common Pleas. There had been a court reorganization that had taken place and when the uh, Court of Common Pleas uh, was first added to have hearings in New Bedford, uh, there was no place for the court to, to, to sit. Uh, prior to that, only county cases had been argued at the uh, Taunton Superior Court. Uh, there was no courthouse in either New Bedford or Fall River at that time. So when the um, court was expanded to allow cases to be heard in New Bedford, they first went to the public library and used that building to do their business until such time as this building was erected. Taunton had been the Shire town, the head, sort of the capital of the county. Uh, in 1828, <clears throat> through an act of the legislature, uh, New Bedford was added as a half Shire town, which enabled uh, cases, county cases, to be heard in New Bedford. New Bedford was a major city. New Bedford had the uh, seafaring industry, and I think that it took on prominence. The Bristol County Superior Court in New Bedford is probably most widely known as the site of the Lizzie Borden trial. However, the court and its building have a much richer history. This building here, the New Bedford Superior Court, was uh, built in 1831. It was designed by a gentleman named Russell Warren. He was a prominent architect of his period. In addition to this building here, he also designed what is now the New Bedford Public Library downtown, which was initially the first city hall of New Bedford. He also designed the Grinnell Mansion down the street here on County Street. And he also was the uh, principal architect of what was initially the Merchants National Bank that is now the headquarters of the uh, Park Service. With the exception of two additions, the core building remains much as it was when it was built. Some of the early pictures I've seen is uh, just what it, pr pretty much what it is now, some old buildings. There was an old building uh, right next door here. I believe the old high school was built in the early 1900s. And I do believe that we had a picture of the Superior Court after it had been opened. And right next door where the high school is now, there's, there appears to be homes there that eventually we either raised or moved or whatever to make room for the high school. So it looked like it was built in almost a residential area, which probably was a little unique for the period, but it appears that that's the case. The main building basically was when you come into the front of the building, uh, you would walk down the main hall and then um, at the end of that first hall, that was the end of the building. Now you go down two, two steps and there's a sort of a, um, like a lobby receiving area. That's the, that part was, all, was added in 1899 when the first of two additions was added to the building. That addition was in the back of the building where previous to that there had been uh, horse stables. Uh, you know, again in 1831 when the building was first opened during that period, uh, attorneys would often come to the building on horseback um, and uh, we had at that time a, a stable back there for them to park their horses as they came into court and argued their cases. One interesting side note about those stables was that uh, during the um, infamous or famous Lizzie Borden case, depending upon your perception of it, because of the widespread attention to the case, two of the stables were turned into a telegraph office during the trial which enabled the news to travel to uh, various outlets throughout the, uh, throughout the country. The second floor courtroom of the New Bedford Superior Court has been the site of three historically significant murder trials. The most famous is the Lizzie Borden murder trial. In 1893, Lizzie Andrew Borden stood trial for the murder of her father and stepmother. Although she was acquitted, Lizzie and the crime continued to captivate people from around the world. Reenactments, books, poems, including a haunting chant about the crime, helped to fuel the question, did Lizzie Borden get away with murder? Following on the footsteps of the Borden trial was the case of Daniel Robertson. When carpenter Daniel Robertson was arrested for drunkenness in August 1893, he was unable to pay the fine. He sent word to his wife Mary he needed more money. Mary refused to help pay her estranged husband's fine. As a result, Robertson was jailed. Upon his release in September 1893, Robertson vowed he would kill his wife. He stopped at a saloon and after several drinks told the barkeep he was going to kill his wife. Finally, Robertson arrived at the boarding house his wife Mary ran. He tricked Mary into letting him in. The two went into the kitchen 
where Robertson repeatedly stabbed his wife in front of their 16-year-old daughter. He fled the scene, but was quickly apprehended at a saloon and charged with the murder of Mary Robertson. This courtroom was the uh, courtroom where Daniel Robertson was tried and was convicted of murder and was sentenced to death by hanging in the 1890s. And the significance of that is that this was the last person ever hung in the state of Massachusetts. It's ironic that it occurred in New Bedford because New Bedford uh, was historically noteworthy for the small number of executions that occurred here. In the state as a whole, between the 1600s and 1940s, uh, there were 435 executions. There were five that came from New Bedford. New Bedford was known for a uh, strong sentiment against capital punishment. Uh, that sentiment may have been uh, driven by the Quaker community that was active in public affairs in this area. And so the fact that uh, Daniel Robinson was the last person hung may be misleading because one has to put this in the context of the small number of executions that occurred out of this city. It is not entirely clear where he was hung, whether he was hung inside of the jail or outside of the jail remains to be uh, an issue of uh, some puzzlement. Uh, it's not clear. Uh, but that's where he was housed before he was convicted. That's where he was housed before he was executed. The trial of Charles Cuffey, a 13-year-old boy who was accused and convicted of killing a neighbor. Charles Cuffey, who has uh, a blood relationship to Paul Cuffey, was tried in this courtroom in 1871. He was accused and tried and convicted of the uh, murder of an individual who lived in uh, Charlotte Way Road in Westport. The belief at the time was that the murder was motivated by a desire for money. Cuffey was 13 at the time he was accused of this. He was linked to the crime because he had sported a, a good deal of money right after the crime. It was, it was a strange circumstance that he would have that money. Uh, he lived on the same road of the deceased. And the police uh, started to focus in on Cuffey. They pulled him out of a classroom and they brought him uh, to the New Bedford jail where he was interrogated. And he was interrogated by detectives who back then were operating under the reward system. This was a British custom, and the British custom was to make up for the fact that police forces back then were small in number. And to, in order to get people to go out and uh, hunt for criminals, to build a case, they offered a reward. So the detectives who were involved in this interrogation we're going to get a reward upon a conviction. So there was uh, skepticism about their motives. And the interrogation was long. And this is a young man who was 13. And a plea at his trial was that the conviction, the confession rather, uh, should be removed from the trial because of the claims that he was threatened and that those threats caused him to have his will broken and that he confessed because of duress. The trial uh, judges at that time rejected that, and he was tried with consideration given to the circumstances of the interrogation, but his words, his admission, went in. And so he was convicted, and a large amount of evidence against him came from his own mouth through his uh, uh, confession to the police. He was convicted of first-degree murder and uh, sentenced to be executed. And his execution uh, was prevented by the uh, efforts of uh, George Marsden, who was the district attorney, known for his strong sympathies for people who found themselves uh, convicted of crime. He went to the governor, who was William Claflin, and he pled for Cuffey's life. And Claflin granted clemency and actually 
uh, Charles Cuffey died in the Charlestown State Prison. And he died of uh, pneumonia, typhoid pneumonia. Uh, you talk about the Cuffey case. Uh, I didn't know about Charles Cuffey. I didn't know about the Cuffey family much. I knew the name. I knew that there was uh, history there. And Paul Cuffey, he was a whaler. I knew that he was prosperous. I knew that um, he had an uh, uh, interesting life. But through Carl uh, Cruz, uh, who was head of the New Bedford Historical Society, we really got a sense not only of the Charles Cuffey trial, but we got a sense of William Johnson, who was his lawyer. William Johnson was one of the first African Americans to be a member of a bar association. It's said that he was one of the first five. And he came here from Virginia. In Virginia, he was a slave, but he was an individual who was an expert horseman. He was a jockey, and legend has it that he won a purse and won his freedom. And he came here, he was illiterate. And in New Bedford, he be became a reader. He became literate, and he started to read the law. And he became, in, I believe in the 1850s, a member of the Massachusetts Bar. He practiced in this state, he practiced in Rhode Island, and of course he represented uh, Charles Cuffey in the, uh, in the murder trial. Uh, so that case uh, really uh, gave me a better sense of uh, New Bedford, of the abolition um, movement, but at the same time, there was a feeling of antagonism uh, towards African Americans uh, by people in this area who had lost loved ones in the Civil War. And it was felt that some of that sentiment uh, was what uh, uh, caused uh, Cuffey to be convicted because it was a circumstantial case. And you know, one would have to, I think, legitimately pause about what his words meant in terms of that interrogation of a man of 13 years of age. Based on photos we've seen and uh, the documentaries that have been done, uh, we feel that the courtroom upstairs where the Lizzie Borden trial had taken place is uh, pretty much in its original condition. There's been very little change in there, aside from, in my time anyway, in the time I've been here since 1990, from a couple of painting jobs we've done, installation of some new rugs. Aside from that, there's been very little done. We haven't touched anything in terms of the original woodworking. Any other stuff has been left pretty much alone. So we feel that courtroom is fairly accurate as to how it looked, not only when Lizzie Borden was tried, but when the court opened in 1831. There are several things that make this courtroom unique. It used to be a three-judge panel. And uh, that existed until uh, the early 1900s. And so in the Lizzie Borden case, in the Cuffey case, in the case of Daniel Robinson, you had three judges, three Superior Court judges who would sit on the bench up there where one judge sits now. The clerk would sit right there, and the judge would sit uh, up on the bench. And so the, the clerk is obviously going to uh, be handling the, the reading, for example, of an indictment, would handle some of the ceremonial language of convening a venire, of, uh, of selecting individuals who would be alternates uh, in the uh, deliberations. So that's, and, and a clerk, of course, prepares all the paperwork uh, for the case. And you know, we've been very lucky in Bristol County. The, uh, the clerks have been uh, very, very helpful. Unlike current courtrooms, this room has two jury boxes, one to the left of the judge and one to the right. Between the jury box and the judge is the witness stand. It's by custom a stand and obviously you stand and you answer questions. And that historically is the way it's always been until um, recent times, we're on new uh, courthouses, the tradition is to sit. Between the jury box on the judge's left-hand side and the spectator is the bailiff's desk. On either side of the bailiff are two white poles. These unique items that you see here are still used today. What this is, is a pole, obviously, that the uh, jury officer will take when the court has the jury take a view. Sometimes in a case, um, one of the lawyers will uh, motion the judge to have the jurors taken to the scene of the crime, the scene of where an accident took place, 
whatever the case may be. When that happens, the uh, officers in charge of the jury pool will take this, th these items, we have two, as you can see, and um, this, allow, this alerts uh, passers-by and other people that uh, there's a sitting jury at work on site and they're not to be disturbed or spoken to during the time that the jurors are viewing the premises in question. One of the reminders of its days as a criminal court is the holding cell located on the second floor. Although rarely used today, it stands as a reminder of the court's history. We have a holding cell here at the Superior Court uh, upstairs. This one in this building here is on the second floor right behind the main courtroom. The practice had long been uh, that the uh, Sheriff's Department would transport a prisoner from the House of Correction down the street. Uh, I imagine back in the day, probably by, uh, you know, horse and buggy and bring him in. Uh, they would come in the back door and uh, up to the uh, second floor holding area. When the addition was built in 1899, we added a staircase in the back there. And up until just recently, and by recent, just recently I mean as uh, 2009, the uh, House of Correction would then transport prisoners in, the, in a van They'd pull up to the side of the building, they would be escorted out of the van up the staircase and up the back staircase to this holding cell in the back. Because now, uh, here we are in 2012, we've since built a brand new facility in Fall River where we hold our criminal business. Uh, fortunately, over time, the uh, New Bedford Superior Court here basically outgrew the criminal business. We just couldn't uh, house the amount of business we had here. And a lot of that had to do with the amount of prisoners that we had in here. There would be days at the end of time where we would have 25 or 30 people in that very small holding area, which I'm sure was designed to hold maybe five or six. We don't have as many uh, prisoners here at any time anymore because all our criminal business is now done in Fall River. On occasion, there'll be one or two random hearings, criminal hearings, cr uh, motions on, uh, um, to revise a sentence, uh, motions of that nature, where we'll have one or two at a time. But even that is very few and far between. Across the hall from the holding cell is artwork that might be familiar to moviegoers. A touch of Hollywood in New Bedford. At the top of the stairs, as you walk down uh, from that first edition, uh, you walk down a little ramp into the old, original old part of the building. Uh, there is this um, uh, grand, uh, it appears to be marble. I'm not sure what it's really made out of, though, um, uh, plaque which and has the inscription in Justice for All. The story goes that one of our court officers, um, Ralph Tavares, who's well known uh, to us and to New Bedford, uh, was able to get that uh, from a friend of his um, out in uh, Los Angeles because Ralph was one of the original um, members of the band Tavares and he had uh, a lot of uh, friends out in, uh, in Hollywood. And supposedly this was used in one of the, uh, one of the movies that um, I want to say it was Justice for All, the movie that I think starred Al Pacino. And um, the story is that Ralph was able to get this from uh, his friend of his. Who, I guess they were just going to toss it away. And he was able to grab it and thought that it would be useful to us here at the Superior Court. And now we have it. The expansion of the court building included the addition of a second courtroom. As with its predecessor, this courtroom was built to reflect its time. While much is different, much remains the same. This part of the building was uh, built in 1953. It was an addition designed by a gentleman named Edward Corbett. He was a prominent architect from Fall River. In fact, he also had his hand in designing the Fall River Registry of Deeds, which abuts the, Fall River, the old Fall River Superior Court. Um, and if you look at it from the outside, you can see that the lines of the building are almost identical. So I, I, I definitely think that they wanted to try and keep the uh, feel of the original building, which again was a classic Greek revival style with the four pillars and the sort of apex over the four pillars. If you're standing in front of the building from the outside and you look at the building, you can see that the new addition has the same kind of uh, degree of arch in its roof to sort of match the original building. So I, I don't think there's any question that the intent was to design the new building to blend in as perfectly with the old building as possible. There was um, an expansion of this building, you know, and the expansion was substantial. I think that this building went from, uh, well, I think two-thirds of this building that you see today were added on in the 1950s. Uh, it was well done. It's a beautiful courtroom downstairs. 
um, you're, really, you're really touched by the, the windows, the height of the ceilings, by the decorative work, the detail. It's a beautiful room. Um, I've always enjoyed sitting there as a judge. Um, and again, it has the uh, right atmosphere for the Superior Court. Originally, it was uh, for the probate court. And the probate court had sessions here as recently as the early 90s uh, before they uh, moved into the old New Bedford District Court. That courtroom also, like the one upstairs, has had very, very minor changes to it in terms of structure. Um, because uh, there are not jury trials in the probate court, there wasn't a jury box per se. Um, supposedly when it was first constructed, there was a, what they called a, a moving jury box. I'm not sure what that means because that was kind of before my time. But uh, once the probate court left uh, this building permanently to go to the new home, uh, we constructed a permanent jury box uh, in that courtroom. Other than that, and again, other than, you know, painting of the room um, and some uh, new carpeting and things of that nature, uh, from pictures we've seen from when the uh, addition was first completed, the room looks virtually the same as it does today. Uh, we have about the same amount of space in the bar and closer for the attorneys. And then back here, the only principal difference really is the galley, just as the whole room is level. The upstairs galley is more of the stadium style where the, each succeeding row is raised a little bit. Other than that, it's very similar in basic layout. The witness stand upstairs is more from the period of when that room was built. This one is you know, more modern. It was obviously added when the bench was built, so it was just a continuation. They did a nice job of kind of molding the same kind of look and pattern of the bench so that everything's consistent. And this one here, there is an actual chair where the witnesses can sit here. Upstairs, they have to stand at that old witness stand. In its heyday, the city of New Bedford often entertained prominent speakers. The Superior Court was no exception. In 1835, the great Daniel Webster, uh, who was probably one of the more prolific lawyers of his time, uh, had a case here at the New Bedford Superior Court uh, in 1835, only four years after the building had been opened. And um, he had such a reputation of being a great lawyer that the uh, story goes that when he came in to argue his case that day, um, they closed the New Bedford Public Schools and allowed any teachers and students that wanted to go watch him, uh, they allowed uh, them to come in to court. The walls of both courtrooms display portraits of New Bedford lawyers who had distinguished careers. The other uh, gentleman too that um, was sort of a charismatic type of uh, lawyer in his day was a gentleman named Timothy Coffin. He was one of the uh, early lawyers in New Bedford. He started his practice of law here in uh, 1811. He also was one of the founders of the Merchants National Bank, which was at that time the bank in the New Bedford area. Um, the story goes that Mr. Coffin was a very flamboyant, very colorful kind of lawyer. Uh, one such story that uh, has been written about him uh, is that on a particular day when he was supposed to start a trial, he probably wasn't quite ready. He was looking for a continuance on his case. Um, from time to time, his mother would come in to watch her son argue uh, some of his cases. On this particular day, Mr. Coffin thought that the excuse he would give the court um, to explain his, not, his unpreparedness was that his mother had to be rushed to the hospital on this given day and that he needed to attend to her. Unbeknownst to him, however, his mother had come into court that day uh, to watch him try this particular case. After Mr. Coffin addressed the court, it's reported that his mother stood up from the galley at the courtroom upstairs uh, to say basically, son, you've been caught with uh, you know, your hand in the cookie jar, so, so to speak, which supposedly led to a uh, big uh, roar from the crowd and a loud applause. But I guess he was this kind of flamboyant lawyer, but a very, very good and effective attorney as well. Lincoln Brigham served as district attorney for a six-year term. And then uh, in 1859, the modern-day Superior Court was formed. The predecessor court, the Court of Common Pleas, was changed, and it became the Superior Court that we have today. And Mr. Brigham was one of the first 10 justices appointed so he was really a charter member of the, uh, the modern-day Superior Court. He would also later serve as Chief Justice of the Superior Court. We also have a gentleman, John Clifford, whose portrait hangs in the uh, downstairs courtroom. Um, he uh, held many positions. He was a state legislator, state senator, state representative, 
but he was also governor of Massachusetts, which of course is unheard of from uh, someone coming from New Bedford. Probably my favorite one is a gentleman named Jose Knowlton. He was, uh, again, a lawyer that had a practice in New Bedford. He was the prosecutor of the Lizzie Borden case. And um, even though he lost that case as the prosecutor, he gained a lot of notoriety and uh, was able to use that notoriety to uh, springboard his career from district attorney of this area to attorney general. Again, hardly heard of to have someone from New Bedford or from this area hold a statewide office of that magnitude. In 2009, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Superior Court with exhibits, panel discussions, and other educational programs statewide. In Bristol County, audiences attended a symposium of the Charles Cuffey trial, a lecture on the last hanging in Bristol County, and a symposium on the New Bedford teacher strikes in 1969 and 1975. Well, I think if you look at this building, I think you can see the wear and tear that may tell you that these uh, tables, these chairs, the benches, go back in time to uh, the period of time that this building was constructed. Uh, but it does have a tremendous charm. I've seen lawyers come in here and, and feel thrilled at the surroundings because it has a sense of, of, of history, of moment, and they are certainly inspired by it. It's a real courtroom. Uh, I, in my life as a lawyer, tried cases here, and I preferred this courtroom to the one downstairs. I, I really felt history was moving in my veins, and I was spurred on by the, by the atmosphere. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent because kids in foster care don't need perfection. They need you. Up to 40% of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov slash business.